Good morning. Uh, most of you can see it here, but uh, for those maybe online that may not have it in front of them, I'll be reading from uh, 1 John 4, 15, actually all the way through 21, the end of that uh, chapter. And you certainly may uh, recognize one of these verses here. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Actually, I just did it myself. Uh, 4, 15 through 21. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he is in God. We have come to know and have believed the love of which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Good morning. For those that uh, are joining us this time kind of in progress because you're a visitor today or um, maybe have been away for a while, we're glad you're here, but I want to catch you up just really quickly with where we're at. This year we're talking about love. And... We, we've been talking about love since January. In January, we began our first quarter by talking about the love that God has for us. So we spent all of January, February, and March talking about how much God loves us and in what ways he loves us and what that love looks like and what it means for us that God loves us and all of those things. And then we began the second quarter to talk about our love for God. And, and we've kind of gotten through some introductory lessons on on what that looks like and and how our love for God should begin to take form and really beginning this week and and through the the following weeks uh, if if everything unfolds according to the plan that I that I think I have up here then um, we will re really begin um, giving some structure to the idea of us loving God and that it that it needs to be done in some specific ways, that, that love for God is a, is a big topic, it's a big idea. It's, it's absurd, really, uh, to consider the idea of a, of a creator of the universe, of somebody that spoke the world into existence, that, that spoke us into existence, and then I'm going to talk about my love for him, like, like there's something that he is missing, and, and by me, you know, extending love to him, that that's going to, to help him or complete God in some way. And, and it really is just, just crazy when you think about it, that, that we even approach the topic of, of loving God. Um, but we've laid the foundation for that by talking about how much he loves us. And it's only within the context of how much he loves us and the fact that he does love us that our love for him means anything. And through the passage that we just read, we only love because God loves us. God has taught us how to love. God has, has demonstrated what love is for us, and he did that specifically so that we would understand first and foremost how to love him, because that's the greatest command, and that's the greatest thing that he asks us to do. And so he doesn't create us and then say, I expect you to, to love me, and then not teach us what that is. He has taught us, and it's within the, the confines of what he has taught us, within the structure of what he has taught us, that we then begin to, 
to kind of discover or understand what it means for us to do that. And so today I want to kind of set some parameters or set some boundaries, if you will, for the type of love or the love that God accepts. And, and I got to tell you, when I, when I even wrote that title, I thought, oh, that, that could give people some, some difficulty. And if you go out in, into today's world and you start talking about the idea of boundaries on love, there are, there are things that are acceptable in the name of love and there are things that are not acceptable in the name of love. You're going to get, if not, if not just some pushback, you're going to get outright opposition. And people are going to say, you can't do that. You can't put boundaries on love. You can't put, um, you can't put borders on what an acceptable expression of love is. It's, it's, not, it's not okay. But it's not only is it okay to put boundaries on love, it's necessary. It, it's absolutely necessary for us to put boundaries on love because if there are no boundaries, then anything goes. And if anything goes, then love loses all definition. It loses all meaning. And I can illustrate that for you in a couple of ways. There has to be boundaries on love. There has to. And if there's not, then, then love ceases to make any sense at all. And so here's, here's example number one. Example number one, does anybody know what next Sunday is? Mother's Day, Mother's Day right? And I, I've talked about her. She's lovable. You guys know my wife. I love her. And to express that love for her, honey, I'm going to buy you that bass boat you've always wanted. <laughs> right? Okay, you're giggling, but if I come home with a bass boat this week, I need somebody's driveway to park it in because it's not going in mine. Um, there has to be boundaries on love. I don't get to go buy Tracy a bass boat for Mother's Day and tell her it's because I love her so much that I bought her a bass boat. That's what I want. If I buy the bass boat, that's selfishness. That's not love. Okay, and that's a silly example, but it, it makes the point that love has boundaries. And there are other extreme examples for sure, not funny examples, but do you remember, some of you remember what happened in March of 1981, a man named John Hinckley Jr. shot President Ronald Reagan because he wanted to impress actress Jodie Foster. He, he had this idea that he loved Jodie Foster so much that he wanted to get her attention and and he couldn't think of any way to do that because he's just a guy and she's this famous actress. And so, well, if I do something big, I can impress her. So I'll shoot the president and that'll get her attention. He did it because he loved her. So it's okay, right? To shoot the president? No, it's not a funny example, but it demonstrates the idea that there are borders, there are boundaries on love. Another, another not funny one, Steffi Graf was a tennis player and she had this fan that was so in love with her that when Monica Seles started beating Steffi Graf, he ran out onto a tennis court and he stabbed Monica Seles. He did it because he loved Steffi Graf. It's not okay. There are borders, there are boundaries on love. We don't get to do whatever we want to do and then say, I just did it out of love. And because I'm doing it out of love, that makes it okay. There are boundaries on love, and we have to understand that. We have to be okay with it. We have to accept it. And we certainly have to practice it. Because in the religious realm, and the spiritual realm, if we don't understand that there are boundaries, there are guidelines, there are borders on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in our expression of our love for God, if we don't understand that, then our worship becomes selfishness. Our worship becomes all about me and what makes me happy. And what makes me feel good. And I'm just doing it out of love for God. But it's not what God has approved. It's not what God accepts. And that is very dangerous ground to find ourselves on spiritually, religiously. Because we want to be pleasing to our creator. And if he has set guidelines and boundaries for us within our expression of our love for him, then we have to understand those. We have to practice those or we will miss him altogether. 
So today we're going to lay some foundations, we're going to lay some groundwork for the idea that boundaries exist. And in the coming weeks we'll begin to look like then, or we'll begin to look at the things that, that we do to express our love for God within those boundaries. Because if we get outside of those boundaries, we're no longer expressing love. We're expressing selfishness. We're expressing self-will. And that's not helpful. It's not good. So, for today, um, we want to recognize that love is the highest moral virtue. Uh, Anything that we say here today to, to establish some guidelines or boundaries for love isn't to diminish love. In fact, it does or should do just the opposite. It should elevate love. It should give us the notion that, that love is so important, love is so necessary that without, without it and without expressing it or doing it properly that we diminish it. We, we harm love itself. And so love is the greatest, high, greatest or highest moral virtue. We know this because God says the, the greatest command, the greatest thing to which we can aspire is to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest thing that we can aspire to, to love God. And the second greatest commandment is to love our neighbor. And so the two best things that we can spend our lives pursuing are to pursue love in, in its various forms, but to do so within the guidelines, within the boundaries, within the scope of what God says is acceptable. And so we don't ever want to find ourselves in the position of saying, the thing I was doing was wrong, but I was doing it because I love, therefore that makes the wrong thing that I'm doing right. It's not... Uh, that math doesn't add up and it doesn't add up within the realm of, of virtue and within the realm of, of um, obey, obeying God and, and doing the things that he wants us to do. So love is that highest moral virtue, but we have to understand that love has boundaries. So boundary number one, and boundary number one is this, love must put God first. It has to. If it puts anything about who we are first, if it puts anything of my desire or my will or my pleasure or my feelings, if it puts those ahead of God and what he has said, then it is not love. Or at least it's not love of God, it's love of self. And that's not the same thing. Our, our first passage we'll look at is Matthew chapter 6. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. There is no putting a foot in both camps. There is no straddling the fence. There, whatever, whatever little idiom or, or, or word picture you want to put to it, you can't you can't do both at the same time. And God says, I will not play second place. I will not come in second to anything. And you might say, I love, I love money 51% and I love God 49%. And that's pretty close. There's not much difference between those two. And so it's okay, God, you're, you're a pretty close second. God said, if, if you put me second, then you don't love me at all. That's what he says. That's a boundary that God has placed on love. We don't get to put anything ahead of him in our expression of love. And, and this passage in Matthew 6 is specifically talking about wealth. It's talking about ma money. The old King James says you cannot uh, serve God in mammon. It's money. It's wealth. But, but put anything else in there. I, I'm, I, we don't you know, we don't replace Scripture with our own ideology or our own understanding, but, but we, we could literally replace that word wealth with anything. You cannot love God and fame. You cannot love God and your job. You cannot love God and 
your family. Hmm. If you put your family ahead of God, then you don't love God. That's hard. That's hard for me to say. And it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. It's hard for us to, to really understand that something that I love as much as my family still has to come in second. And if I ever put that above God, if I ever put it first, then I have completely destroyed any concept of actually loving God. God will not be made second place. God has placed a boundary upon the expression of our love for Him. And number one, that boundary is we must love Him first. We must love Him most and we must never make him second place. James 4, verse 4, James writing there says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That is strong language. Has anybody ever called you an adulterer or an adulteress before? You, you guys that are married, has anybody ever accused you of cheating on your spouse? Those are fighting words. That's, that is strong language. But James said, if you want to, if you want to flirt with the world, if you want to pretend like there are things in the world that are okay and you're going to go pursue things that are in the world you can't pretend then that you have made god first in your life you are an adulteress you say that you are pursuing god but in reality you are pursuing earthly pleasures in reality you're pursuing fleshly things and that makes you an adulterer an adulteress those are strong words, but it gets the point across that love has boundaries. God comes first. Anything else is an abomination. Anything else is not love for God. It is love of self. Second, God places a boundary upon us in regards to his, our love for him by telling us that love is fearless. 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 to 19, part of our reading this morning, said, by this, love is perfected. And we talked to it two weeks ago when we talked about um, love, love is one of the accompanying characteristics of, of true love for God, of love that, that we need to pursue in our love for God is maturity right? That, that if we have a juvenile understanding of scriptures or a childish view of God, then our love for him can never be complete. And, and so here is that word perfected in verse 17, and it means it carries with it that idea of maturity. And so by this love is perfected, it is made mature, it is full grown. By this love is perfected with us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love we love because he first loved us love is confident love casts out fear mature love is confident and maybe what we mean by that is that it is sure of its power and its purpose love is is it's not arrogant first corinthians chapter 13 tells us that love is not arrogant it does not boast it is not puffed up right but true love is confident in its expression true love knows its recipient so well that i can confidently express my love to the one that i claim to love and i can know that that expression of love is appropriate and that that expression of love is what it's supposed to be or what it should be love is confident and and we see that sometimes i think in in young relationships where it's like oh i don't 
I don't know if I should get this gift or I don't know if it'll be well received or I don't know if if this is the right gift for that person that I'm, I'm getting to know and I love. But then when you've been married as long as we have, I know she doesn't want that bass boat. So I'm not, I'm, not even, I'm not even going there. But there are things that I can buy with confidence. There are gifts that I can get from my wife with confidence. And I know she will like them because I've known her a while. True love is confident in its expression. And we don't have to walk on eggshells or tread lightly because we are so familiar and so comfortable with one another that I can express myself openly and fully and I know that it will be accepted because my genuine expression of love will be received by one who genuinely loves me. Love is confident because it is sure of its ability. I know that when there are difficulties in my life, that there are people that can make me feel better just by their presence. And those people know how to approach me when I am in the depths of despair. They know because of our relationship with one another. And they have confidence to be able to come to me and, and talk to me in those difficult times because of that relationship that we have with one another. True love, mature love, is confident in its power, in its purpose, in its ability, but it is never arrogant in its behavior or in its execution. Perfect love casts out fear. Second passage that we have listed there from 2 Timothy, another great um, description or, understand, or, or passage that helps us understand love 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, Paul there is talking to Timothy in the first few verses there. He's, he's telling him about, you know, rekindle that gift that you have from the laying on of hands. And not only that, but from your upbringing uh, at, the, at the feet of your grandmother and your mother. And, and then in verse 6, for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So, he is strengthening, he is encouraging Timothy in the expression of the gift that he has received. And then verse 7, where we'll start here. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. That word timidity there means cowardice. God has not made us cowards. He has given us a mission, a purpose, a job to do. And he doesn't want us to go out there and flee at the first sign of difficulty. He doesn't want us to go out there and be cowards in the way that we execute the things that he has given us to do. Verse 8, one of my favorite words in all the New Testament, therefore, because it means you have to go back and look at what was just said. And, and Paul just told him, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but one of power and love and discipline. Because God has given us that Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus for all eternity." God didn't give us love so that we could go and do the things that we want to do. God gave us love so that we could go and fulfill the purpose that he has called us to in Christ. That's what he says. That's what Paul tells us right here. He says, therefore, go and, and don't be ashamed of the testimony, but go fulfill the purpose that God has given you in Christ Jesus. God has empowered you to do that by granting you knowledge of his love for you and teaching you how to love. Because God has taught us how to love, we have the ability to go out and fearlessly follow him. We have the, the ability to go out and and do his will with confidence in a world that is going to oppose us, in a world that is going to stand against us. And yet we stand confidently in our love for God and express that love for him even in the face of difficulty. Love has boundaries. We must love God first. 
and we must love fearlessly. Our third boundary is this. Love must obey. John chapter 14 makes this so clear. There just can't be any misunderstanding. There can't be a a way to miss this. The connection between our love for God and our willingness to obey Him. John chapter 14, and and in this chapter, Jesus is still in the upper room with His disciples on the night of His betrayal. He's already washed their feet back in John 13. Uh, Judas has already left the building to go and find uh, the high priest and his cohort to come and, and arrest Jesus. But Jesus hasn't left yet to go to the, to the garden where he's going to be arrested. Jesus is still in the upper room with the 11, the 12 minus Judas. And here as he is teaching them, he is going, he's going deep with them this is his final session with them before his crucifixion and so he really is expounding upon things that are of great importance both in the in the immediate things that they're going to face but also as they move forward from that time into the early days of the church in john chapter 14 verse 15 jesus tells them if you love me you will keep my commandments Did they love him? Go back to John chapter 11. We just studied that one in in class on Wednesday night. John chapter 11, they they come back to Jerusalem knowing that Jesus' life is on the line and, and basically they said, let's go with him and die with him. They loved Jesus. And Jesus says the expression of that love will be seen in how you obey my commandments. Guys, it's easy to obey Jesus when things are going well. It's easy to obey Jesus when the crowd is on your side. It's easy to obey Jesus sitting right here in this room right now. It's easy. But later that night, the soldiers were going to come. And they were going to arrest Jesus. And Jesus was going to be taken to trial and he was going to be crucified. And in those hours, it was hard. It was hard to obey because it was dangerous. And there weren't a lot of people who were willing to do it. And it might come the day in our society when it becomes dangerous to obey Jesus. It might be even getting there now when it's certainly not popular to stand up and and proclaim that we will obey Jesus. Christ but the question is do we love him and if we love him we must obey him it's a boundary it's a boundary that's been placed on love you can't you can't proclaim love for Jesus and then refuse to obey or downplay the importance of obedience or say you know what I'll I'll do it when it's easy or I'll do it when it doesn't cost me anything It's all or nothing. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Follow that line of reasoning there. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. That's, that's like point number one. Jesus said, if you know my commandments and you keep them, then you are demonstrating love for me. But he makes a connection then, and he says, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. I want to be loved by the Father. And in order to be loved by the Father, Jesus says we have to express our love for him through our obedience to him. And I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. There's a lot of ands, there's a lot of connections in that passage that go back to the, to the first part of it that tell us it starts with our obedience, our expression of love for Jesus through our obedience to him. If I'm not willing to obey, then I don't love him. 
And if I'm not willing to love him, then I miss out on the love that the Father has, and I miss out on the love that Jesus has. Tell me that obedience isn't necessary. Tell me that obedience isn't important. Jesus says that it is. Look at verses 23 and 24. Jesus answered and said to, the, said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. How much clearer can Jesus make it? Three times in this discourse, he ties love and obedience together. Jesus places the boundary of obedience upon our love for him. If, if we profess love for him and we refuse to obey, then love for him does not exist. And if we love him, then we will obey him. He makes it so clear. And so these are the boundaries. Not that we place upon love, not that Certainly not, I hope, that I am placing upon love, but these are the boundaries that I see that God has placed upon love in his scriptures that he has given to us. We need to love him first. We need to love him fearlessly. And we need to love through obedience. Those are the boundaries that he has placed for us. And those are the things that will give context that will give parameters to the things that we talk about from here on out as we talk about what that love looks like then what are the appropriate expressions of my love how do I demonstrate to God that I love him what does it mean to obey okay Jesus says if you love me you will obey my commandments well my next question is what are the commandments I, I want to demonstrate my love for Jesus what is it that I need to be obeying We'll be talking about those things over the, over the coming weeks as the expressions of our love for God. And so we wrap up with this thought. Our call to action today is this, is this idea that we must live within the boundaries that God has placed. Our love for God must be on His terms. I don't get to do whatever I want to do spiritually, religiously, in a worship sense, whatever, I don't get to do whatever I want to do and say, I'm doing it out of love, therefore it's okay. Any more than I get to buy a boat and try to claim it's because I love my wife. Love has boundaries. And if we're not okay with that, then we don't understand love. And if we're not okay with the boundaries that God has placed upon our love for him, then we need to check our hearts. Because we're putting somebody and something in front of God. And we need to make sure that we are living our lives for him. So this morning, our, our lesson is complete and we want to offer the opportunity for any who may have a need to come before the congregation to uh, to ask for prayers or to ask for baptism or study or, um, or whatever the case may be. If you have any need that you can bring before the congregation that we can help you with, we would love to help you as we stand and sing.